Okay, so it's a pleasure to welcome Kate Lancaster from York. I had to pause there to make sure I got the right around. <laughs> um, Kate must be older than she looks because her pedigree doesn't fit on this post-it note. So, PhD in Imperial and the Central Laser Facility, followed by a postdoc at the Central Laser Facility, and then a permanent position as an experimental scientist, mm. which for some reason you gave up. And walls were sloping inwards. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, then you became the industrial officer of the York Plasma Institute. Mm -hmm. But now you're back in research, and you're the research fellow for impact and innovation, also at York Plasma Institute, as well as being the head of the Fusion MSC. Mm. Yeah. There you go. Cool. For my sins. All right. <laughs> After all that, more important stuff. Dinner is at seven at uh, Mr. 1983, for those of you who told me you were coming. Um, see you there. Okay, please. Okay, okay, so, well, that was a lovely introduction, so I don't need to say too much more waffle about where I'm from. Um, so, I'm going to talk a bit about some research that <coughs> I have been doing over the last few years. Um, so, this is sort of my swan song coming back into research after having sort of thrown my toys out of the cotton gun. <laughs> I'm not doing this anymore and then coming back because you can take the girl out of the laser, but you can't take the laser out of the girl. So anyway, here, the rest is history. So, um, yeah, so essentially I'm going to tell you a bit about the research that I've been doing. Um, warning, it's hardcore experimental, because I'm an experimentalist. So if there's anything or any terminology that I use that you just go, what the hell is she talking about? Just ask me. That's totally okay. Hi. Don't use any three-letter. I'm not three going to. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I do, then yes, you're, 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 you're allowed to pull me up on it. So... <coughs> Just for those of you who don't know anything about the York Plasma Institute, it's, it's, it's probably the biggest uh, university-based plasma group now uh, <coughs> in the country, if not Europe. Um, and that's mainly due to the fact that we stole an entire group from Queen's University, Belfast. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I came, I came to the York Plasma Institute um, in the January of 2012, um, so it just been around for a few months actually, and it was formed around the original plasma group that was at the University of York. Um, so essentially, my boss kind of went to the EPSLC and said, hey, we want to do this thing, give us money. And, and they said yes. So, uh, so the result was this institute. And the, the idea around it is to bring together all of the different disciplines of um, plasma physics, as a all. We have a solid um, pedigree in magnetically confined plasmas, so you know, your traditional tokamaks to do fusion energy. So there's a big fusion flavour in a lot of the work that we do uh, at the Institute. Um, we also have inertially confined plasmas, which is part of my expertise is in, but also general uh, laser plasma interactions as well, which is uh, what some of you guys do. Um, well, sort of. <laughs> the physics underlying it. <laughs> um, we also have low temp guys. Now, they're, they've got all the applications, let's say most of the applications. So that can be anything from chip manufacturing the plasmas associated with chip manufacture to finding the people to, to, to fix prostate cancer, for example, or heal chronic wounds. So, you know, there's a, there's a vast range of things you can do with these sort of low temperature, atmospheric temperature, atmospheric pressure plasmas. Um, and each one of those groups can find parallels in, in the universe, and, and so every single group has astrophysical plasma kind of um, applications as well. So we currently have 19 academics, we don't have 10 postdocs anymore because two of them got jobs, so <laughs> a bit less than that now. Um, and around 49 PhD students, so it's pretty big. Uh, it's a really vibrant place to be, and there's lots of crosstalk between areas, which is the idea of it. Um, and actually, when I came to work there, I was trying to connect all of the people in the institute to industry and vice versa to try and kind of get a bit more sort of practical application to, to what we're doing. Because as, as I've said, with the low temp plasma, there's a lot of kind of ways in which we can work with industry around those kind of topic areas. Um, <coughs> we also have uh, the UK's only uh, doctoral training centre in fusion energy, which we're the lead partner of with, with uh, four other universities. And I run the, the Fusion Masters again, which is the only course in the UK for, for fusion energy. So if anybody ever expresses any interest in doing fusion, just post them our way. We'll be happy to host them. So anyway, that's enough of the guff around. We, let's, let's talk about some physics. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, fast electrons that end up being produced from when a laser interacts with a piece of material. Um, and basically what happens is they diverge strongly and I'm going into quite a lot of detail about why that's a bad thing. 
Um, and then I'm going to talk about how we might mitigate this divergence of these electrons, um, tell you a little bit about the recent technology advances which will allow us to be able to do these experiments, uh, and then I'll tell you about an experiment that we've done, uh, which is the culmination of all of these kind of developments. This is by no means the end of the journey, this is the absolute beginning, because this stuff is really hard to do, it turns out. So. Uh, I've just finished writing a rather large grant, which I'm very close to pressing go on, which will enable me to do a lot more of this stuff. So, yes. But before I go into the detail, obviously I need to show you a picture of the team that have been uh, responsible for delivering this work. Um, obviously some weird at the front there. Um, these guys here, you'll probably recognize these two, I think, uh, the Chris's. Um, and this is my student Damon, this is Zoe, this is Petra, she's from Pisa, and this was a master's student we had. Um, they were all part of the team on the experiment um, that we did on the Vulcan Petawatt laser in September last year. Um, and my student Damon's been doing a lot of the work around the data analysis and stuff as well. So um, that was a happy little team, but um, it's nice to see the faces behind all the faceless graphs later. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> you can see who's uh, involved. So, I like to start off with this picture because we don't get to see that uh, very much at all, that image. That image is a plan view of one of the most intense laser plasma interactions possible in the world. Uh, so that's a, a, a petawatt laser, 10 to the 15 watts, being focused down onto a piece of material um, with a focal spot of around 5 microns, so you're getting focus intensities of about 10 to the 21 watts per square centimetre. So it's, it's pretty beefy, right? Uh, and that's here in the UK. That's the Vulcan Petawatt laser, um, just up the road where I grew up. I say grew up, I mean as in scientifically grew up. Um, what you can see is, so the, laser, so the target position is here, and the laser's coming in from this side. You can't see the laser, it's infrared. This is real colour, so it's an SLR just being focused down onto that interaction point. Um, the only filter is an infrared filter because the infrared would absolutely blast the CCD, which, you know, generally they don't like you to blow up expensive uh, SLRs, although I have blown up more expensive cameras than that. To be fair, it's just a hazard of uh, these extreme interactions. Um, you can see the interaction here, this is the plasma forming. You can see a lot of green light. Typically what happens is the laser can be re-emitted as harmonics. Uh, so if we have a 1053 nanometer laser, it can be the second harmonic of that is green. Uh, and so that's why you see a bunch of green light. This thing lighting up here is actually uh, a stack of um, radiochromic film, which is a dissymmetry media which measures uh, proton beam profiles. I'll tell you about what, where those protons come from in the next slide. That's been ionized as well, so you're getting a plasma at the, at the detector. Um, and generally, the, whenever we take those detectors out and we've put the Geiger on and it's gone, <laughs> and then we go, ooh, put that in the box, put that away. There's a burn patch on the front, that's why. So it's perfectly normal <laughs> part of the interaction, but uh, we'd never really seen that happen before. Um, it's a pretty picture, but it's very difficult to understand the physical picture here. So there's a rather crazy uh, plot that's been taken from this paper down here. Um, and I've put this, in, this cartoon in just to try and give you a, a, an idea of what the hell's happening inside the target when an ultra-intense laser, uh, laser interacts with it. So, laser's going to be above 10 to the 18 watts per square centimetre, and that magic number means that the particles are kind of uh, relativistic, let's say. They're, you know, some fractions of the speed of light, pretty, pretty beefy uh, energies. Laser um, can uh, ionise the target, uh, get, and the energy can get absorbed in a number of different ways. But what happens is uh, some of the energy is coupled into uh, the free electrons that now exist because you've created a plasma there, and you're punching in mega amp currents. Right, it's pretty, pretty hefty uh, currents being pushed into the target. Um, and obviously, if you've got a current propagating, you're generating a magnetic field around that, that could be hundreds of mega gauss. So again, really high, uh, high magnetic fields. Um, the gradients on the front of this target can actually generate magnetic fields at uh, uh, a gigagauss level. So you're approaching sort of neutron star atmospheres here. So that's extreme. Temperatures 
similar to the centre of the sun, 10 or 15 million degrees centigrade. So you're creating some of the most extreme conditions on Earth in this tiny, uh, you know, tens of micron space. Now, this current won't propagate unless you draw a cold return current that uh, is going the opposite direction. So then you've got this propagating current. Now, the highest energy electrons reach the back of the target um, and leave. A sheath region is set up here, which then draws out any um, hydrogen that's contaminating the back surface. So there's positive ions being drawn out. So you get the sheath region, and that stops any other electrons from leaving the target. So then they start wrapping around to the side. And so these electrons are the driver of much of the physics inside the target. And what happens to their energy? How does it couple into the rest of the target? How do these electrons transport in what is not solid, cold matter, but in fact warm, mushy plasma, which is not the same? It is not well understood how electrons are moving around in this kind of fourth state of matter, rather than cold solids. And in doing this, in, in this interaction then, you, you get you can accelerate ions to MeV energy, tens of MeVs. Um, you've got these relativistic electrons, and then these electrons being transported in the target can produce um, hard X-rays through Bramstall and radiation. Um, you've got uh, hot temperatures, which means you've got atoms being ionized at different ionization levels, and so you're getting a characteristic line X-ray emission, which tells you something about the temperature and density inside the target. That's a fundamental diagnostic for plasma physics. Is characteristic x-ray lines which tell you something about the temperature and density. You can get neutral particles produced if you make the target of deuterium, for example, or uh, protons can smack into things and, and through PN reactions create lots of neutrons as well. So what you can start to see is actually these targets and then these short interactions. So the lasers I'm talking about uh, today are on the picosecond time scale but certainly other lasers that we use uh, for this physics can be on the tens of femtosecond time scale. Um, you can create these really short, ultra-bright uh, sources of something. So be it hard x-rays, be it protons or neutrons or whatever. This is a field that's burgeoning actually in terms of industrial applications uh, because you could produce, if you monkey around with just the target, not the, the laser, you can produce multimodal imaging capabilities with different sorts of uh, radiation so that you don't have to go, oh, today I'm going to this LINAC with this aircraft engine. Now I'm going to ISIS, uh, not the bad people, but the <laughs> neutrons, of, um, with, to, to look at it with cold neutrons or whatever. They can rock up and do it all at once. We don't have the lasers that can quite realize that yet, but that's five years away. So this is a really high. Well, what do we need for to change in the lasers for us to be able to do that? Right, so uh, that's a good question. Well done. Uh, so at the moment, um, we have two sorts of lasers. We have ultra short pulse, um, but low energy, so sort of tens of millijoules <coughs> level. And they can fire at a high repetition rate. Uh, and the reason why is because they're much more efficient and they, there's not a big heating load on the, uh, on the amplifiers within the laser. That's the thing that limits how often you can fire. So these, um, these ultra-short pulse but low energy lasers can fire many times a second. The lasers I'm talking about today are high energy and the physics that I'm talking about is being driven by high energy. So hundreds of joules but contained within a picosecond. So they're both the same intensity but one can fire many times a second and has lower energy and the other can fire maybe five times a day, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so you have to have a lot of patience. Well, actually, normally it can fire every half an hour, but that's not how it works out. Um, so, you know, we're taking 10 shots a day. So you have to be very careful and very thoughtful about what shots you're taking and, and, and what information you can extract from that. And I'm not a patient person, so you might wonder what the hell I do in this field. But anyway, so I'm getting to the point. Uh, the, so ultimately, what you really want is a lot more energy but at a high rep rate. You need those lasers to realise really chunky sources, but you also need those lasers to realise fusion energy driven by lasers as well. Um, it turns out the UK is super good at building lasers, and we are not far away from uh, having these, uh, what we call diaplant solid state lasers. Um, I can talk about that a lot at the end, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> um, 
Uh, we have a big project here. We're selling laser heads abroad, but not here uh, because there's no money. So uh, anyway, uh, this stuff is coming online. So it's, it's a really good time for this kind of stuff. So, oh, that's quite a jarring skip there, isn't it? Right, so um, what happens though is as these electrons are being punched into the target, they don't just go in one direction, they spread out, they're heavily divergent. Um, measurements from uh, the early 2000s up till, uh, well, in fact, up till 2007, um, show that the divergence of these beams can be anything from like 20 degrees cone angle to 60 something degrees cone angle, but this all depends on what diagnostics you're using to take the picture of it, um, because they depend. depend. That's the thing you realise as an experimentalist, is you're looking through the world at, with a diagnostic window that doesn't necessarily represent the full picture. <laughs> so you have to understand what it is that it depends on. Um, so this is some work we did back in 2007. Oh God, 11 years ago. Um, what we did was, what you can do is um, take a copper <coughs> target, for example, um, and you can excite copper K-alpha in that target. So it's just a, you can knock out a K-shell electron and then you can see the uh, uh, characteristic emission of the cascade back down to uh, that level. Um, and we can measure that. And that is, so basically when electrons propagate through the target, they can knock out K-shell electrons and then you get this characteristic copper K-alpha. So it's a really good diagnostic of where the electrons are going, right? Any K-alpha will do, we just use copper K-alpha because as with all these target things, material choice is partly to do with the kind of activation you're interested, but partly to do with what materials they have <laughs> or is possible to use. So, um, and what we would do is we would increase the thickness of the target um, and then look at the back surface of the target. This is quite simple actually. You just look at the back surface of the target with a, um, a spherical uh, imager that looks, is set up to look at that particular line. Um, Shine that onto a CCD camera, you get a spot of copper alpha, which is uh, indicative of the size of the electron beam as it reaches the back surface of the target. So if you create um, a series of shots where you're increasing the thickness of the target, then you, if they're diverging, obviously that spot's going to get bigger. Uh, and that's indeed what we found. Um, we also used something called shadography, which I'm going to explain later. Um, but basically, this K alpha shows. Um, massive uh, divergence of around 60 odd degrees um, and that's the biggest divergence that was ever measured and that's not a good thing we were quite sad because the time we were doing this work we we're really interested in um, uh, using it for laser driven fusion so conventional laser driven fusion is you, you take a, a, a sphere of deuterium tritium and, and kind of crush the hell out of it with lots of powerful lasers and it kind of self ignites so it's like a diesel engine the approach we were looking at is to take the compression phase and the ignition phase and separate them. So we would compress the fuel uh, to sort of moderate density but assemble more mass so you could burn more mass so therefore the gain is higher, so you get more higher yield. Um, and then the, the, the spark plug is in fact these mega amp currents of hot electrons which then penetrate into the fuel and, and, and ignite it, uh, raise it to you know, millions of, hundreds of millions of these Kelvin that you need for fusion to occur. So that's called fast ignition, so you'll hear me talk about that. I, uh, back in 2007, that was my thing so much, my thing, right, is to try and understand this. And so that's the reason why we're trying to understand these electrons. I'm more interested from a fundamental perspective now because they drive so much of the physics inside these targets that's not just fast ignition related. So <coughs> secretly, under all of it, I still really love fast ignition, but we might tell the funders that because I don't think they really care about it. Um, <laughs> but that's really what I like. Um, so we saw that, and then we, we carried on this work. This was a student, um, so I was just doing my postdoc at this time. James uh, was like a few years behind me, um, doing his PhD, uh, also at RAL. Um, and he did a meta-analysis of all the divergence measurements that had ever been done and plotted them against intensity. And what he showed was, in fact, as you get uh, higher in intensity, the divergence gets worse. Uh, and, and for... for, for um, for fast ignition, that's bad, right? Because we're hoping to sort of sit in this region um, of laser intensity, and rather than your electrons going where you want them, which is this dense fuel blob to heat it to fusion temperatures, they're spraying out all over the place. Simply, the, the problem with that is um, 
you're going to need more laser energy in the beginning because you're wasting so much of it, and that's bugs. And also that's laser architecture as well. It's the difference between using, I don't know, a two metre scale focusing optic and a four metre scale focusing optic. That's a big difference in technology uh, and so forth. So, <coughs> well, sorry, would, wouldn't this depend on the, on the target the diversion? So if you somehow have to normalise or you know, uh, fully use the same target? It or? doesn't tend to. It doesn't tend to. The, the, the targets, they're pretty much all metallic targets. So, they, yeah, we weren't using any sort of plastic mm -hmm. or, or so forth. So we're pretty comparable. We don't see much. I mean, obviously, there's a massive error on this anyway because with laser plasma, the error on any of our measurements is big because the, the lasers are very variable because we're pushing laser technology to the very edge of what we can do. So the laser parameters that you can deliver very well be. And I'm going to show you a bit more about that later. Um, it's quite frustrating. Your hand is up, yes. Uh, speaking as an ignorant medic, you couldn't use an electrical field to actually focus your... Ba, 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 ba. I'm coming back to that. That is literally the point of this talk. So you saw. <laughs> Hi. So, why is it linear? I mean, you'd think that as the, as the intensity goes less, as it spreads mm. out, then the, you'd follow this and it would, uh, it would become less, uh, it would spread out less. So it would actually start to focus rather than go uh, uh, in a constant cone. Sorry, say that again. So I'm saying that as, uh, if it goes out in a constant oh, cone, see, then the yeah. intensity goes down. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. And so but, yeah, I'm so saying that the, 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 the angle depends on the intensity. And so yeah, so that, that, so this is the intensity of the, the interacting beam rather yeah, than... Sure, yeah, sure. So, so that is true and it depends on what you use to measure. So copper K alpha is a cold line, right? So it's just collisional. So it just shows you where the electrons are going. If you were relying on something that was ho getting hot, so this is... We, ha we used XUV also, which is just a Planckian emission from the back surface. You can see that that actually happens that the, the divergence goes down is simply because you've spread that energy out over a wider area. So, so that's why we use the cold line like copper alpha because it's just simply indicative of where the electrons are going. So, but that's a very, very good point. Um, yeah. Uh, why the hell does any of this matter? Well, um, this is just application slide as, as with all these things. Mostly we're interested in the physics, but there is a point behind this. Firstly, it does underpin much of the physics of this, these kind of interactions. Um, we can produce these sort of special states called uh, warm dense matter and hot dense matter. Um, and that's very useful for understanding the nature of stellar interiors. For example, uh, the opacities of iron and the equations of state inside the sun, are, these are not settled areas uh, at all. Uh, we can create these kind of effects in miniature and probe them and study them rather than having to rely on doing stuff in the sun, which is hot and inconvenient. Um, Again, these kind of states are ones that you achieve uh, in ICF. And when we say we're creating miniature stars, we kind of are. The temperatures, densities, and pressures are very similar. Well, the temperatures are higher, but the pressures and densities are very similar. Nuclear, and, and again, with nuclear astrophysics, I said, you know, we can do these sort of, create these astrophysical conditions in miniature. Once you start getting to kind of hot temperatures, like not, not some EV, but we're talking KV temperatures, Electronic and nuclear levels start messing around with each other, and the interplay of those levels drastically change kind of um, lifetimes of um, and, and cross sections of uh, uh, nuclear reactions. And so, what you would get inside stars, uh, the kind of nuclear reactions you get inside these burning stars, is completely different. Or supernova, for example, is completely different to the stuff that you produce in the lab, apart from this stuff. Mm -hmm. box. <laughs> and then, of course, even just the this fundamental matter, this hot, dense matter that is, we can't even produce enough of it to probe it reliably and study it, yet that's the point of this, is that the, the, the physics in this is, is not settled at all because it's very difficult to produce and probe at the same time. Um, so things like the resistivity of the material even is, is unsettled. Um, then as I was describing as well, uh, it's really important for uh, generating sources. This particular one would be important because we're generating a bunch of hot electrons going in one direction, brilliant for directional sources of Bremsstrom, for example. But in the kind of 100 
to 500 kV range, which is super good for um, rad hardness testing for space, uh, space hardware, mm. uh, which is nice. There's a paper on that if you're interested in that by Bernard Hiddig. So, um, when electrons propagate uh, in a material, magnetic field generated, uh, and if you put a simple Ohm's law into Faraday's law, you end up getting this expression uh, for the magnetic field that's generated. Um, this term here basically pushes electrons towards regions of higher current density. This region here, there's a, a, a magnetic field created due to a gradient in the resistivity of the material, right? And that actually keeps uh, electrons in regions of high resistivity. So <coughs> this starts it and then this finishes, let's say, because this won't last forever because resistivity drops as the temperature of the material increases. But then once the electrons are kind of together, then this term is also useful. Uh, so some super smart people, Alex Robinson and Mark Sherlock, uh, I think Mark, I think they were both at, uh, at RAL at the time uh, that they came up with this idea, um, is that you can use a gradient in target material uh, resistivity, so hence Z. So if you can use a higher Z gives you a higher resistivity and a lower Z gives you a lower resistivity. If you can make some gradient in that, you can create a magnetic field which will collimate the electrons. Uh, and they did some simulations. Um, they used a code at the time called LIDA, which is uh, it's a hybrid code whereby you can, ex it, it, you can describe the background kind of um, fluids, the ions and electrons, as a, as a fluid model. And then when they get energetic, they get promoted to, uh, in this case, normally you would use a particle in cell model, which is what is traditionally used. In this case, they were using a vessel for applying kind of kinetic description, because that's what Alex was all about at the time. Um, they're now using a PIC model uh, in, in Zephyros, which I'm going to show some more similar. Am I going to show some more similar? No, I don't think so. Anyway, <coughs> yes, I am. Um, so what we've got here is just a plain target with just homogeneous Z. So just a, a uniform resistivity. Um, then we have a low resistivity area and a high resistivity area. So that's higher Z, lower Z. And you can just see these are kind of wire-like features. Okay, and, and all of the differences here is just the radius of the wire like feature. Now, what, what happens is you end up uh, injecting, it doesn't do laser plasma this, right? So what you end up is injecting a distribution of electrons that you would expect from a laser plasma interaction, which they can model. They're injecting the, la uh, the, the electrons from this side, um, 750 femtoseconds into the interaction. You can take a picture of, of the propagation uh, so this is electron density, uh, and this is, yeah, this is just electron density plots. Um, so you can see, for this homogeneous case, you get the classic divergent behaviour, which is what we were trying to mitigate against. But you can see, happily, that even just the, this is a step function, and the, the reason seems it's not a gradient, it's just a step function, right? That you get the electrons being confined to these features. And obviously at this point, experimentalists were going, ha, 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 ha. maybe we can do something interesting here. Uh, obviously, it's one of those things where we go to the target fabrication people and they take a very sharp intake of breath, like, oh, I don't know. At this time as well, the capabilities that we had available to us are not nearly as good as we have now, which is why this is really only just coming to fruition now, actually. Um, so early experiments, definitely there was a kind of intake of breath. Right, we'll give you the simplest things that we can deliver. Also that helps us because obviously as physicists, the first thing we do is the simple thing uh, to try and understand uh, what is going on. Problem with um, laser plasma interactions as well, solid target laser plasma interactions is, is a kind of whack-a-mole situation where you change something to do with the target to understand the physics, try and diagnose what's going on, but that also changes the physics as well. For example, having, even having a Z jump in a target, you can understand changes 
the propagation of the electrons through the target, for example. So that's fun. Um, and so you have to really understand what the measures are that you've, you've put in place inside the target. It's like, for example, adding a tracer layer in there to, add, to make some characteristic X-ray line to understand the temperatures, temperatures and densities at a particular point in the target will affect the propagation of the electron. Fun. Anyway, so early experiments. So this is Satu Kar. He's at Queen's uh, University. Um, what they did was they just took a sandwich target. It's kind of a 1D situation, really. Um, so this is a, a aluminium cladding with a tin layer in the centre. Um, interacted the, the laser with the, with the tin layer. Okay. Um, and then on the back surface, what they did was they looked at the optical transition radiation. So when electrons pass a boundary, they radiate. This is dipole uh, radiation. And you get uh, the radiation is, is, is cor strongly correlated to those electrons leaving the target. So that's only a very small proportion of the electrons that are generated, because I was talking about that sheath region set up, and that hinders the rest of the electrons leaving the target. But the electrons that, the es that do escape the target, you can see that the optical transition radiation that's strongly correlated with where they're going is very, very confined to this layer. Okay, so that was so that was the first indication that this might be an interesting. Uh, there might be something in it physically. Um, so then the next thing you would do is uh, bury a wire in a piece of material. Now you think that looks rather simple. That is a massive headache, especially at that time. Burying a wire in a piece of uh, material is is was very very difficult for them to to produce. And so the number of targets that were even achievable at that time was next to none. So the, st the statistics on this was poor, I will tell you that now. Despite the fact that we only have a few shots a day as well, but that's... Yes. Um, why, is, why is it difficult? Because it's because the target is so small. Uh, well, so this, this wire is like probably 20, 20 microns or something, 200 microns length. Um, but what happens is, right, you can't mechanically join that wire. Because if you mechanically join, as I say, put a wire and then snap something around it, you get a vacuum gap formed here. That vacuum gap forms a sheath, and what you end up with is electrostatic confinement, which is fine, but that's not what we were testing. Um, that may also well have happened anyway, but I don't want to say that, because I was actually on that experiment. <laughs> 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 you know, these things are imperfect. But. So what, what ends up happening then is you have to coat in a coating run so they have these coating plants where you put the wire in and, and, and the coatings build up over time. That takes ages. Like, and you, it's really hard to get a thick coating on these things. So that's why th these are almost a non-starter in summer. Hi. Um, silly question. So these targets are one use only. These targets are? One use only. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Vaporized within, uh, you know, a peak a second. I do often feel for the target fabrication guys because that's when weeks and months, you're painstakingly making these things and we just shoot them and then repeat it's kind of sad, yeah. But anyway, yes, yes. For the greater uh, good. It is for the greater good, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'm not very patient, so it wouldn't be good for me, but. Anyway, um, so essentially what they did here is, um, these guys are just um, test targets. Uh, this is target thickness, so like that. Um, these are test targets, so planar targets. Um, again, they're using techniques to measure the source size on the back and therefore the divergence angle of the electrons. Basically, the, the main diagnostic was, uh, was an X-ray pinball camera. And that's as simple as it gets. Uh, an X-ray version of the old uh, hole, in a, hole in a shoe box, essentially, right? Um, and um, what you can see is these filled ones are these guys, the 200 micron buried wires. And you can see these guys are diverging here, and these are the planar targets. So you can see that by employing this target, they did actually get a reduction in the, in the divergence angle, which is a really great thing. Um, I think people lost patience with it because of the, the just sheer difficulty in, in producing these targets. And also, the other thing is, this is exceedingly difficult to shoot. You're looking at a 20 micron uh, tip of a wire. The laser spot is about five microns. There is also a natural jitter of the laser. So even if you align 
the laser perfectly to that point, because of thermal variations and other like idiosyncrasies with the alignment process, it may not shoot exactly where you put the alignment laser. And so we call this jitter, and it's unavoidable. And I spent a lot of time trying to mitigate that uh, this coming experiment. So it turns out with these wire feature targets that after the wire, the electron beam will diverge again. So that's fine if you want whatever it is you want to heat, for example, you just stick it at the end of the wire. But with something like inertial confinement fusion, there is a standoff between the dense fuel and where you've produced the electrons, where there can be no object. So you need the electron beam to be able to stay correlated beyond the, beyond the feature. So Alex came up with another uh, really excellent idea, is to actually make a kind of conical solid feature as your resistive element. And it, it acts as an optic, essentially. So electrons that reach this wall kind of reflect from that wall, um, but off of the magnetic fields that are generated at that uh, resistivity gradient. Um, and your opening angle reduction, so this is, uh, this angle here is alpha, and this angle here is the divergence of the electrons, and so this would give you some reduction in uh, the divergence. We were very excited about that because the simulations show that the, the, the beam stays collimated beyond the elements, and that's what we want for fast ignition, which is originally why we, we were playing around with this idea. So this is sort of when I came back into research. So I came back into research like very, very late, 2014. So this is, and with experimentalists, you can't just go, oh, I'm going to do research again, immediately do an experiment. You then have to put in for time and then wait for someone to go, yes, you can do that, and blah, blah, blah. So that's why I'm always jealous of theorists, because you have a pencil and a paper and a computer and you can just get stuff done. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> in principle. Yeah. Um, so what happened is the first time we did this experiment, uh, we were using physically machined targets, so uh, an aluminium feature um, surrounded by plastic um, cladding. So, so this substrate, the cone was sort of machined onto this substrate, so this full length was 100 microns, so this is this guy, and then you clad it in this CH. Um, the thing that we realized as soon as we started shooting these uh, targets is they're hard to hit. Uh, and um, the, date, the, the laser conditions at this time were very challenging. It's probably the nicest way to put it. But essentially, there, there had been a laser defocus uh, caused by an element in the system that we weren't uh, aware of at the time, which is sad because even if the focal conditions vary slightly at the front surface, it drastically varies the content of the electron spectrum and how many electrons end up in the hot tail, for example. And so you end up with very variable conditions, so it's quite difficult to interpret what's going on. But we learned a lot about how to play with these targets. I say play, it's hard work. But <laughs> um, also, what happened is that we couldn't have many of these exquisite machines targets produced, we were pushing them to the capabilities that these CNC machines could deliver. Uh, you know, this is a this is a 30 micron tip here. These, these machine these giant machines that machine this tiny feature cannot produce enough of those targets, cannot coat enough, you know, the quality varied. So essentially the target fab guys said, unless you give us money to do some development for another way, we're not going to do these experiments again because we can't deliver to you uh, the kind of level of targets that we would expect to deliver, which is fair. So I went to the department and went, please, department, give me some money. And they did. And uh, we had a £10,000 development project with um, the CLF Target Fab Group um, in conjunction with their spin-out company, SciTech Precision. Uh, and so what we did, uh, I say we, I just gave them the money. What they did is um, they developed a way of producing these tiny features uh, by etching silicon wafers. And that means per wafer, you can get 150, 200 targets, uh, which is fab. 
because eventually when we get to the point where we can have high repetition rate lasers, then we are not going to be target limited. And we're certainly not target limited at the moment because we're shooting no more than 100 shots per experiment. So, uh, And these these type of targets slow me down anyway because they're difficult to align. So beautifully, we now have a little feature here. So this is a kind of bowl, so 300 microns uh, wide. This is the etched feature, uh, so our little cone. And then you can fill this bowl with the cladding that you require. Um, so glue, which is plastic essentially. And what we end up with is our familiar target. So this is our guide element on the substrate with our cladding. And then what we did here was we popped a, a, a titanium uh, nano thick dot, so 150 nanometers thick. Uh, and what we wanted to do is excite titanium K shell to look at the temperatures and densities at, that we were able to achieve. Um, ha so great, We've got the targets. People finally go, okay, take this uh, experiment seriously. Uh, so we uh, did an experiment in September uh, of last year. Um, so uh, the laser of Vulcan typically throws five to six hundred joules down the chain, but taking into account um, uh, reflection efficiencies plus, we, we also have something called plasma mirrors. Um, because you think that a laser pulse looks like this in time. Uh, but, but it doesn't. In fact, uh, what it ends up with is you have a pedestal uh, beneath the main spike created by uh, amplified spontaneous emission in the laser. This on a t this type of laser is of a sufficient intensity level when it gets to the target that can ionize the target. So what you end up with is laser plus very low density plasma equals bad times. So what you want is the cleanest interaction surface you can possibly get. So what we do is we have what's called a plasma mirror. So you focus the laser onto uh, a piece of glass that's specially coated. The laser at this point, um, this part isn't sufficient to ionize this surface. As you get to the rising edge of this, this ionizes. Plasmas are extremely highly reflective. And so then you, you then reflect the rest of the pulse. So what that basically acts to cut off the front of the pulse and make a really high contrast interaction. So that's this guy here. Um, so when you take into account these efficiencies of that and the plasma, you end up with about 100 joules of useful energy on target, which is still pretty decent. Um, it contained within a, around 600 per seconds. Um, and we were shooting targets that were clad. So these silicon features are clad in plastic, unclad, just to compare, because actually it turns out the sides of the, the cone could um, get sheath formation on the sides and you can actually probably electri electrostatically confine the electrons as well. So we're kind of interested to see if that worked out. So correct for pointing that out. Um, and then control foils of silicon uh, to compare. Uh, and they all had identical rear surface conditions. So uh, titanium dot plus um, a very thin layer of plastic on the back, which basically tamps the expansion of the titanium dot so that you preserve the density of that uh, titanium dot, which is really important for spectroscopy. So if you have a gradient in the density, then modeling spectroscopy at all, because it's super difficult. You want one, it's hard enough to measure one, model one temperature, one density. So if you know that you've got a gradient, it's gonna be non-starter. So that's why you have to tap the, the rear surface. So I know that this, to the untrained eye, essentially looks like someone's got a load of kit and gun. <laughs> which is kind of what it is, but over a period of two weeks. Um, so let me just point some key things out. This is a spectrometer here, another spectrometer here. Um, there are magnets on the front to deflect charged particles because they can interact with the bodies and create x-rays, which interfere with the measurement. Um, that's your proton pack, which I pointed out in that slide before that was being ionized. Um, behind that, behind the RCF, which measures the proton beam coming out, uh, we had some image plate, which is kind of like the stuff they put in your mouth in the dentist to take a picture of the inside. Um, it's reusable uh, film, which we can measure the 
um, the electron beam profile, profile of the escaped electrons that come out. Um, very important alignment system which I'm going to describe uh, and a bunch of other diagnostics you can't see because it's kind of zoomed in so um, this will give you a better idea of how this is all going down. So we've got a laser coming off a plasma mirror onto the target, proton and electron stack. Now that's into half of the beam, the bottom half of the beam. In the top half of the beam we've got a lens looking at the optical transition radiation which is emitted by those electrons passing the boundary. That's just to monitor the focal spot. We have um, uh, an X-ray, uh, a sort of more sophisticated hole in a shoebox, which is uh, a, a pinhole array, um, which is a diagnostic that was innovated by the PISA guys, hence why Petra from PISA was there. Um, and also you can get single hit, uh, so that gives you spectral information. We have two spectrometers here. This guy was looking at the titanium k shell spectra. This was looking at silicon k shell spectra. This is another laser. It's a second harmonic beam which probes transverse uh, to the target. What that shows you is the expansion profiles on the front and the rear. So you're looking at the hydrodynamic motion of the target. This guy here helps us align the target and also know where we hit on shot. Uh, and that's the sources which will illuminate the target for that. So going back to why these experiments are so difficult, I've just explained to you about the jitter and why that's a problem. The, the jitter is on the order of 20 microns and the features are on the order of 20 to 50 microns. So inevitably, you're going to miss at some point. So we need to know. We can't do anything about it, but we need to know when we hit and when we don't hit. So we constructed a system whereby we used uh, an infrared source to align the target, so because the beam is infrared, so we can see the target focused in infrared with the beam smack on the end of that little feature that's beautiful. Uh, that's the, the focus position. And then on shot, where that laser hits, I mentioned that you get harmonics of the original laser uh, emitted. Strong in the interaction region, that correlates with where you hit. And so if we measure that second harmonic emission in a second camera, we will, we will understand where we hit on shot. So if we take the before image and overlay the on shot image, we know exactly where we shot relative to the tip. So it's an invaluable tool uh, for understanding you know, whether the shot is a success or not. This is the first time really we've ever needed to do stuff like this. This, this just shows the complexity of the experiments that we do and it's got lots more uh, complex. Usually we're just shooting at planar foils, so this, this jitter problem was never an issue. It is now. Um, and this was actually done by Alana, who was my master's student at the time. She's now going to do a PhD with uh, David Neely, actually, so, um, who's at Rutherford uh, Strathclyde. So uh, it gets people in, which is fun. Um, so just to show you some uh, outputs from that, this is the IR channel. We did have it in better focus. And I don't know why it looks so bad. You can see the tip there. This is an unclad one, so the empty bowl. That's the bowl. That's the feature cone. So it, Aligned on there. This is a filled one, and this is the second harmonic channel. So you can see the tip there, and this is this kind of glue region inside the bowl. This big blob of glue here is a thin alignment wire. I think you need to worry about that, but that's what we use to position the, the focal position. Um, so when you overlay the on shot image over the, the, the before shot, you can see the second harmonic directly overlaying with the tip, so that counts as a hit. This is a clip, so it just wings it, and then it's a clear miss. And so this is, this is something we did not have on the first experiment. So we are able now to understand where exactly where we hit and categorise these shots. That is frankly miraculous, <laughs> because knowing, knowing exactly uh, where you hit is just so valuable for these quite complex interactions. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of data to finish, because I mean, the point, hello. What proportion of your shots are hits then? Um, that's a go. Off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, I'd say sort of like. Yeah, no, I can't answer that question because it depends on how many of the. We did more, so we we had a lot of hits, but it's because we shot more of the club targets, so that's why. Yeah. So. But yeah, off the top of my head, I can't remember. But um, we did pretty well. We've got statistics, which, frankly, for our kind of experiments, is a is a miracle. Um. 
So what I'm going to show you here is, so this was the proton stack, and behind the proton stack is this image plate stuff that we use to measure the electron beam pro profile of the escaped electrons. So it's just a very small proportion of high energy electrons that escape the target. Um, we wouldn't expect the feature element to have a big effect on these escaped electrons because they're very high energy already, so all, already pretty directional. So we wouldn't really expect them to have such a big effect. Um, also, if the, if the front conditions vary at all, the content of the escaped electrons varies wildly. So it's one of the most variable measurements you can make, which makes it the most frustrating. So what we've got is iron interspersed with image plate. So that's image plate one, image plate two, image plate three. So that's energy going that way. Um, so the things that I'm going to show you is just for the first piece at the moment, because we've got just so much data we're trying to trawl through. Um, what happened here is when you scan these things in the special scanner, um, a chemical reaction takes place um, when the radiation interacts with the plate, and then it has to go in a scanner, and a laser rasters across the plate, and you get this sort of photostimulated emission, which you then image, and that's the image that you get uh, out. Um, so when you see PSL, that's photostimulated luminescence, which is what's happening inside this machine. Now, if this piece is saturated, then the, the image that you get is saturated, so you have to scan multiple times in order to understand. Now, as you, every time you scan, you knock down the, the um, intensity on the plate, so it doesn't constitute the real measurement. So Dean Rusby, who's at Rutherford, developed a code which will then backfold the data so that it would be as of piece one. So if you're looking at a scan of piece six that was, is non-saturated, he then unfolds it to get back to the original intensity that would produce, because uh, he knows the proportion of loss over each scan. So um, so we did that, so we got back to piece one, essentially. Um, and then taking line outs this way and this way, um, fitting Gaussian stitches to look at the, the beam size. We, you can get a crude energy measurement, which we haven't done yet, so we need to do that. Um, and so we're right in the middle of this analysis, so what I'm showing you is proper preliminary data here. So, um, so the thing that, you, um, that I can show you here right now is, just from piece one, uh, vertical line out, this is the divergence angle of the beam, and this is the laser energy. Um, what you can see is the, the, these guys are clad hits, so these are the, 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 the um, green triangles. These are your silicon controls, and then these are misses, uh, and this is just silicon plus glue, which is what would happen if you miss the element and just hit the cladding. Uh, it's effectively the same thickness as that. Um, what you can see is this varies quite a lot, but also these are fairly correlated with each other, which means we're not seeing much of an effect with the escaped electrons, which is what I said. I wouldn't expect to see a massive effect with the escaped electrons, to be honest. Um, if the front surface conditions are varying, um, this will also affect the measurement. What we've got is some data now where the, the laser guys are running a diagnostic uh, called a HAZO, which allows us to understand the defocus uh, on shot. We might be able to unfold that from this and then look at that as well, because that does uh, uh, affect the intensity, which then affects the, the content of the escaped electrons. That being said, I'm now going to present some rather exciting data that is not strongly correlated with the escaped electrons, rather more what it is happening to heating at the risk surface because what you want to do with these electrons is heat stuff <coughs> right and that's so that's important so what we've got here is a, a probing image so it's this um second harmonic probe so our laser which is the infrared laser is coming in this direction that's the front surface and then the green laser is probing this way so this is a before shot image and this is an on shot image so you can see front surface expansion here rear surface expansion here. This little guy here, that's the second harmonic emission at the front surface as soon as the laser hits. This is a, um, although you're taking a picture with this laser at plus 200 picoseconds, this laser light is time integrated because it happens as soon as the laser hits the target and if the camera's in the way, you'll see it. So that's really useful because it actually defines where the original target surface was as well as that. They should correlate roughly. Um, so what we can do is measure the expansion distance 
that it expands at the rear surface. We can then use that with the knowledge of the fact that that was taken 200 picoseconds after t equals zero, which is the interaction point, and calculate the expansion velocity. The expansion velocity depends on the bulk electron temperature here, the half. And so um, this will tell us something about the, the temperature at the rear surface. Me and John Pasley, who's based at um, York as well, uh, we did a paper back in 2009 which used these rear surface expansions in conjunction with hydrodynamic modelling to, under to actually calculate rear surface temperatures. So it's a really it's a simple method um, to, to understand temperatures where you don't have to put tracer layers in, for example, and affect the transport. So that's why we did it. Um, but it turns out it's quite useful for this experiment. So happily, what you can see here is these are our clad cone hits. These are our silicon controls because they're the true uh, they're the true controls. That's 100 microns of silicon um, without feature because the element that you're hitting and the substrate is 100 microns of silicon. So this is the true kind of control stroke active target situation. What you can see um, again, this is expansion velocity plotted against laser energy. You can see that all the clad cones are hotter. Well, they have faster expansion velocities, so we surmise they are hotter than the controls. That got me very excited because that's what we want. We want this stuff to get hot, that's what we're aiming for. Um, and so, um, you know, you can make an argument, oh, that's just because these are slightly lower in, in, in energy, but actually, if you drew a line, that would suggest that coupling quite a lot of energy to the target would result in no expansion, which we know is not correct. So I'm convinced that this is this is a real effect, which is rather exciting, but we've got lots more analysis to do because what we need to do now is take those expansion velocities and then combine that with hydrodynamic modeling, modeling to understand the uh, um, temperatures. Um, and just finally, uh, Chris Murphy, you may or may not, Chris, does he know? Yeah, anyway. Um, my name. <laughs> uh, his two students uh, are developing a caesium iodide array. Um, this, it's a scintillator array to detect um, hard X rays for the kind of work that they're doing on the quantum electrodynamic stuff. So, um, looking at hard X rays produced from those situations. However, he was developing those diagnostics and said, Can I put them on your experiment? I said, Yes, of course, because obviously that's a, that's a nice thing to have. Um, uh, some hard X-ray measurements um, at a different sort of angular distribution around the target. Um, just to give you an idea of what, what they are, they're, they're cesium iodide crystals uh, placed in a, a four by three, I think four by three array. Um, they're optically isolated from the outside world and from each other because what happens when the X-rays interact with them is they scintillate. That scintillated light is, is imaged onto a CCD camera um, and then that will tell us something about uh, the strength of the hard x-rays but also this gives you some crude energy resolution as well which we've not unfolded yet we're just looking at total sorry for longer at the moment um and so there are a bunch of um positions both inside so this line designates the inside of the vacuum chamber which is where everything is uh and then outside the vacuum chamber as well um what we've done is folded these two over because we're incident at zero degrees in the analysis, we folded these two over because at zero degrees you'd expect the interaction to be symmetric. Uh, you, you would worry if it wasn't. <laughs> so, for just for the sake of ease of looking at this stuff, we, we folded these two over into the pot. Um, so, what you can see here is so this guy here is this one that's directly on axis, and so what it's showing is that the, the Bremsstrom production on axis where the electrons are going. Is, is strongest for the hit clad targets uh, compared to other types of target. Um, this means average of eight, average of four, average of three, average of two. So this being an average of eight is rather exciting. So we need to do a lot of work to unfold what the expected distribution of um, very strong would be and try and compare it with this uh, data to see if it's in any way representative. Uh, Again, I'm quite excited about this because that kind of correlates with where the electrons are going. Um, all of them, not just ones that escape. There's electrons in the target producing the first one because they need to be in the target to produce first lot radiation. So, um, so, so basically on that note, 
Uh, we've had a we had an interesting experimental ride. We've learnt a lot. I think we're at a really sufficient position now to begin this work for realties. Like we've got a we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to understand this data and a lot more experiments to do. Um, I can tell you some secrets as long as you're not going to tell anyone else. Um, I will put you on this. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, but who's going who's gonna to listen? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, the electron beam profile data, which is the, the escaped electrons, this really small proportion, is variable, and that strongly correlates to the front surface conditions. And we know the front surface conditions are varying. We now have that data, so we'll probably be able to understand that a bit better. So, there's limited effects seen on the, on the beam size and uh, total signal. However, the transverse probe, which is correlated to the rear surface temperature, has really good data and is really exciting. Same with the branch lung, there's really encouraging data at this point. So, still lots to do. There's a bunch of simulations we need to do uh, as well. Like, for example, how mist is mist? How far can you go off the element before it stops working? Things like that. We need to understand all of that stuff. My students do that, which is good. Um, so, on that note, I'm going to shut up because I've talked for too long. Um, questions? I know you were asking questions all the way through, but have to. Oh. Yeah. Um, you talked quite a bit about mitigating the divergence, and then you showed data, but you, see, you didn't seem too happy about the data. But they, they seemed to me, it seemed okay because they were diversion was quite low. Because you should, at first you showed these old results of yeah. 60 degrees, but now you were down to 10 or 20. So it, that's it. Yeah. So what we're measuring. Uh, with this particular electrons is just these escaped electrons, right? Mm -hmm. The divergence we were measuring before are, are, is the emission from inside the target oh, okay. into in, uh, as far in as the one over E depth, right? So, you're, so it's sort of an integrated uh, signal. So you'll get an understanding of what's happening inside the target. The electrons that escape are just those ones that escape. They're highly energetic and already quite directional, so they, it won't directly correlate with that. So that's why I'm not that concerned about the fact that we don't see a big effect there. Um, moving forward, I want diagnostics that have more of a correlation with what's happening inside the target. Now, why I did the titanium dot is so that I could get some spectroscopy at the point where those electrons were interacting with the rear surface. The risk was I chose to do titanium helium alpha. Uh, and the reason why I chose that is because you need to heat it to hundreds of EV for it to be significant. And I wanted it as a switch. So if we did get the rear because normally at those kind of depths, you're looking at a few tens of EV with a normal target. And I was hoping to show that, you know, we were divert, you know, directing it with simulation show that we were going to get up to KV temperatures. But, you know, take that with a pinch of salt. Um, so I was thinking, okay, right, I'll use um, titanium helium alpha as a switch. So if we get to 100 dB, we'll see titanium helium alpha. We didn't. Or rather, it probably wasn't in sufficient quantities that we would be able to measure. So that was, the, that was the risk. So in that, we lost that diagnostic because it just wasn't sufficient to see that. Um, data. So it's that kind of spectroscopic data that is important and that I would try and just use a different um, bunch of lines to, to understand. That being said, we do have the single hit data um, and so we may be able to look at titanium K-alpha. Sorry, I'm banging on here. Um, you can get a shift in the K-alpha line which is dependent on the temperature of the target. And so that we might be able to, if we have sufficient resolution, we might be able to still not yet to get spectroscopic data from the inside of the target. Because that's, I don't care about the electrons leaving the target because they're not the ones that are interesting. You want to know about all of them. I mean, they're partly interesting, but it's not the full picture. So it, it's tricky. But I know lots now uh, compared to what before that experiment. I know how to write these things now. I know what to do. And so every time we do this, uh, it'll be better. Now, here's the exciting secret, so don't tell anyone. Um, we have talked with the target fab guys. They should be able to replace the plastic cladding with a foam cladding. 
of plastic, plastic foam. What that will allow us to do is proton probe the fields. So essentially what, it, what we're able to do is we've got our target. This is now foam region. Now we've got a second laser plasma interaction here which produces protons and those protons will go through here. We get RCF here. Those protons will be deflected by these fields uh, that, are, that are growing in this region. And so we should be able to it, it, um, use proton deflectrometry to measure the growing fields. And what's interesting here is the highest energy, the highest energy protons will reach the, the stack before the lowest energy ones. So through the stack, you get the time history of the interaction as well. So we'll get a time history of the growing of these fields. No one has ever measured that before. Uh, I'm super excited about that. So that's part of what this grant is about, is to actually probe the fundamental physics of this stuff. Is it actually working the way we think it is? Because uh, I think we're beyond just firing a laser at this and seeing what happens. I think we need to understand the physics in order to improve it. So that's what, so that's what we do. And then the other thing is, uh, you can't use these uh, resistive guiding techniques on femtosecond systems, which is what we were talking about earlier, because those magnetic field grows over hundreds of femtoseconds. So what we're hoping to do is use the electrostatic technique on femtosecond systems and see if that works. Hurrah! Uh, and that's been more useful for, for sources. So there's a lot we can do, and I'm quite excited about that. And we're going to use very similar techniques to probe the electric fields, because you can use protein deflectometry in this case as well. So. I'm really excited. I just want someone to give me some money so I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Oh, well, I've got a good chance, yeah. It's a lot to take in, wasn't it? <laughs> cool. Yeah, there's nothing else, and let's thank Kate again. Thank you. Season review of seven for Dindins. Dindins! <laughs>